Well, if you have been here the last few weeks, you have noticed that we have stayed in the chap sixth chapter of John for quite a long time now, and we've broken apart piece by piece. It is the bread of life chapter, and it is the longest narrative in all of the, the Revised Common Lectionary. It's longer than we talk about Easter or Christmas even. So there's something here for us, isn't there? There's something there. The bread of life is just a beautiful passage, but then it starts getting confusing. Some might even say weird. It's starting to get out of our comfort zone to hear about that. Imagine the people that heard this the first time. These were people that are hearing Jesus say for the first time, and they have no communion table reference for it, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, being observant Jews, they're like, whoa, Psalm 27 says, save me, Lord, from the evil doers that devour the flesh. This is not a good thing. This is not a good comparison. And also, they've learned over and over again the Levitical laws that they are not to drink blood because life is in the blood and only God has the right over life. And so this is hard. We have maybe tamed it so much by familiarity, but this was hard for them to hear. And last week, uh, the passage that we read talked about bread as instruction. And that, hmm, that's not so hard to swallow, right? But the flesh of Jesus as that bread of life, that gets harder. And many of them turn away, like this is too hard, and they start leaving. You know, Jesus has not taken um, the typical church plant and church growth seminars. Don't say hard things, say the comforting things. Well, Jesus didn't do that. He said some really difficult things to explain. It's a mystery that invites us. A mystery we cannot comprehend intellectually, but there's something there that still invites us in. I am not going to explain it. You can be happy. <laughs> Chris is like, what? You're not going to explain this? No, I'm not going to explain this. Because it is inexplicable. It is a mystery, and the mysteries of God are not easy, easy to explain. But what we are going to do today is to walk through the mysteries with our brothers and sisters. As we go to the font, as we come to the table together, we're going to experience the mystery that we cannot explain well, right? It is a blessing. There's a blessing there for us that is beyond what we can know intellectually. It's a special day. New life abounds this day. In the first service, we had welcoming of Harbor, his first time to this church, and we had Thanksgiving for the birth of a child. Now, you can't explain exactly how God weaves together, knits the body in the womb. But it's something to celebrate. And when you saw that little guy, if you didn't see him, you better see him because he's really cute. There's something that is just so fresh from the hand of God about a new baby that it brings tears to your eyes. It is a miracle, but we can't explain how it happens. And we're going to the font today with Mariah, where she is going to um, have the bath of regeneration, and there's something there that defies our understanding intellectually, but there's something very beautiful there. And to make that even more beautiful, her mom is going to be at that font with her, reaffirming her baptismal vows. So this is a day where new life abounds, and after the font, we will come to the table. So there's so much happening today that I don't think you need me to explain it. And thank God for that, because there is no human explanation for these things. But it's going to be walking together and hearing the voice of God through the grace of that walking together. I was thinking today, because there was a new baby in our midst, and 
um, it just brought to mind. And also Olivia is with her niece and nephew, so she sent us a picture of her holding her little nephew. There's just something so beautiful about life in that very beginning. And I remember that as a mom, even though it was quite a few years ago now, I remember that. I remember those days, and I remember a rhythm. The rhythm was bathing, feeding, and changing. And then again, bathing and feeding and changing. And that was the rhythm that you live when you're a new mom or have a household with a new baby in it, because fathers help with the changing too, right? There's something wonderful about that rhythm. And it occurred to me that that rhythm is somewhat like the sacramental rhythm of the church. Birthing, feeding, and changing. So that's what I'm going to just briefly talk about today here as an introduction for what is to come and how we walk together through this. First, the bathing. Washing clean at the font of regeneration, as it says in Titus. New life. The old is buried, and when you rise from the water, there's new life. There's a new creature that is created at the font. And we can't see it on the outside, but what our senses fail to see, our spirit knows that God is active there. God is the primary actor there. It's not us. It is God doing something there, something that is beyond human comprehension. And if you have ever bathed a baby and then got them all ready to be given to someone to hold, you know that you often put lotion or something on them or that smell of Johnson's baby soap that is just so like this is a baby. You know, it's just so beautiful. There's an aroma about a newly washed baby. And somehow, mysteriously, there's the aroma of Christ at the font. When we have a baptism of regeneration, there is a, an aroma of Christ that we all sense and that we take into the world with us. Not just Moriah, but all of us again, like, I love that new baby smell. And we'll all be there together to see that, to smell that, and to know that we actually carry that pleasing and healing aroma to the world around us. Even where that font is placed as a reminder to us that we are new creatures. We come past the font into worship. And as we go past it, we remember there's a new creatureliness to us. I'm not the same person I was before. And as we walk through there, we're urged again, live out that baptism. Live the way that you were washed. And so that's our prayer. That's our encouragement to one another. First, there's a bath. And after the bath, as we told the kids um, as they came forward, there's a feeding because new life requires food. And it is a different kind of food. And this is the mystery of today's passage. We don't understand exactly what Jesus was saying there. Even now, even all of these theologians and centuries later where people have talked about it, we don't exactly know what it means, but we know there's something very special there. Pastor Katie and I have both the privilege and responsibility of helping get kids ready for their first communion. Or adults, too. If there are adults who have never done that, we would love to work with you as well. But how do you do that when it is something that's inexplicable? When there's more happening than what meets the eye? When there's more happening than what we taste or feel or see? How do we do that? In the way that we have done it with Mariah and with others before her, and probably in the future, too, we will, we look at the different names of this meal and then we talk about what does that tell us of this mystery. So first we talk about communion. What does communion mean? And we look at all the words that start with that prefix. Communion, togetherness, community of the Savior, a community together, gathered together, living life together. And so we talk about that. 
with, with someone who's preparing, and then we look at it as the Eucharist, good gifts. There is such, there's such mystery of God's great gratitude, or our gratitude to God for the graciousness that God pours into our life. The good gifts of God. That's what we remember when we come to this table. In fact, if you listen carefully to the presider, it tells you to lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. And then you say it's right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. This is a table of thanksgiving. This is a table where we remember God has been good to us. A girlfriend of mine once said to me, what would happen in our lives if God took away everything for which we were just unaware it was a gift of God? What, where would we be? There's so much each day beyond what we can um, even count or see that God gives blessings. And then the final, the final way that we look at the table is the Lord's Supper. And we remember that night that Jesus was betrayed and all that he was going to give and sacrifice for himself, but even as he gave that sacrifice for all, he wanted to give his disciples something to hold on to. And so we're given this meal as a way to hold on, a way to remember the sacrifice, a way to be grateful for the sacrifice of what Christ has given us, that new life that only came by his sacrificial death. So there's so many ways to look at this table and see what God's goodness has given to us. One of my um, writers that I enjoy reading, he hasn't written enough, <laughs> but um, the things that he's had, he has written, I kind of, you know, um, latch on to right away and watch for him. His name is John Vanderleer, and he's a Methodist pastor in South Africa. And he writes about the communion as being a hungry feast. You're given just a small morsel of what is to come, what is to be that feast where we'll be at that heavenly banquet. But you're given enough to ingest Jesus into your life and have that flow into every cell of your being. And yet you leave hungry, I hope. I hope you leave hungry for more and more. And so... We have been bathed, and we will be fed. And what is next? Changed. This part can be not a really good analogy, because I don't want to talk about diapers here, <laughs> okay? Although diapers are filled with things that are refuse from this world, right? And so are the things that we're changed from. We're changed from glory into glory, the word says. We are changed in our hearts as we become more and more like Christ, the likeness of Christ to this world, the aroma of Christ to this world. And so there's change for us. Not just a bath, not just a meal, but there is change for us. And thankfully for all of us, that change is not just one moment in time, but that changes our whole lifetimes, going closer and closer to Jesus, more and more reflecting Jesus to those around us in the world that so desperately needs Jesus. And so, bathing, feeding, changing. Bathing, feeding, changing. That's the rhythm of new life, and that's the rhythm of our communal life together in Christ.